All right, thank you. Hi, my name is Damon. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, so first off, um, to thank Steve for asking me to speak. Uh, I I love to um, I love the opportunity to carry the message of of uh, what was uh, given to me, and um, I find that the more that I give back for having received, the more I end up getting. And the more I end up getting, the more I feel the need to give back. And it's and it's a loop that's that's kept me in this process. Um, but also, there's a lot that's been going on in my own life uh, right now, the last handful of years, especially the last handful of months. Um, life, life has been happening, but the volume's kind of turned up. And, um, you know, every opportunity that I have to fulfill this as a primary purpose puts all the other stuff into perspective. You know, it helps me to realize that that's, that's not the focus of my life. This is really the focus of my life because the reality is I'm, I'm not really supposed to be here anymore. Um, I can think back in my own history of, uh, you know, a number of times that I, by all rights, I should have died that day. And so the, the perspective that I try to take that I have to keep bringing myself back to is that this is bonus round. This, this time doesn't belong to me. Um, so I really uh, appreciate this opportunity. Um, talking about three and four is uh, is difficult to do without talking about one and two. You know, I've I've found that um, there's a real beauty in how each of these pieces leads into the next. Each one sets me up in a way that you know, I, I when I first came in, I heard about the four step, like it it scared me. And I think it should have because I I wasn't capable of the fourth step at that time. I wouldn't have been capable of the fourth step at that time. I wasn't even capable of the second step at that time. I was in a position to be able to take step one. And taking step one changed me in particular ways and opened me in particular ways that led me to be able to take step two and so on and so forth throughout each of the steps, right? So um you know, it's helpful to be able to see what the, what the program has in store, um, just to kind of begin to have an understanding of it. But um, recognize whatever step you happen to be on now. If you're if you're new, that's that's really the only thing you need to be focused on today. Um, but my my first step, um, I used to think of step one as being the the drunk log. You know, I would I would be at meetings, I walked into AA, into the fellowship, and I, I I was the guy with a day. And so everything I heard, I took as the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so with, with each share, I was sort of adding something to my understanding of that. And I, I, I came to see at some point that that is not necessarily the case, right? That there's a, there's a large fellowship um, of Alcoholics Anonymous, and then there's a program of Alcoholics Anonymous which is what we have in, in our book. Um, and so my understanding of the first step, like when I would hear people tell their story or speak on the first step was, you know, if there was a 20 minute lead, it was 20 minutes of all of the horror stories and the drinking patterns and things. And what I came to, to see and realize is that, that none of that stuff is, is my first step. All of that stuff explains my need to take a first step or the or the experiences that I need to reflect on in order to take the first step. But really the first step was my coming to a different perspective on those things. That all of those things that happened throughout my life, I minimized or blamed other people for or just blocked out altogether. Um, you know, uh, attributed to different things in me. Coming into AA and having somebody walk me through like these early chapters of the book, um, in light of AA's definition of alcoholism, allowed me to see it in a different way. Because I came in, and I think like most of us do, like come into AA with a particular definition of alcoholism in mind. And conveniently, I, I did not fit my definition of alcoholism, 
right? I came up with a definition that allowed me to continue drinking and not think of, of, of me as an alcoholic. So as I was going through then um, the book, I, I, I came to understand what AA's definition of the problem is. And, um, you know, there's the piece about the, the allergic reaction to, to alcohol, right? I put it in my system. I can't control what happens next. I don't have control over the amount that I take and, and whether it's, whether it get, there might even be a night when I'm not drinking as much, but I don't have a say in which night is which. I don't have a say in when I'm going to drink less and when I'm going to go all night long and empty my account and, you know, take strangers drinks off of the bar and, and things like that. Um, and that was kind of the understanding that I had had of the first step up until that point. I should, I should say I was, I was in AA and going to meetings, um, for, for three years at the, at the point when, um, I found somebody who I could hear that this guy had something different. And I went to him and I asked him to show me what he was doing. And he's the one that pointed out to me that distinction between the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody had really made that distinction to me before. I would say, oh, I've been in the program for three years. Right? And he helped me to see whether or what I really knew about the program to, and to help me to understand it. So as I started going through that our written program, I started to see, wow, that's not the, the, the I'm an alcoholic, I can't drink safely, is not step one. I came to see that step one is I'm an alcoholic and that means I am going to drink again. It does not matter whether I want to or not. It doesn't matter whether I'm thinking about alcohol or not. It doesn't matter the necessity that I have to stop. I'm going to do it again because I have no power over my relationship to alcohol. And that was a very different thing. And that in and of itself is kind of like I, the way today I look at one is like it's a death sentence in and of itself. That leads into step two. I did not really want anything to do with the God stuff. And so it was only that recognition, that deflation, that focus on the hopelessness of my condition that really left me open to something else. And, and for me, it was, you know, I... I thought from the little Cliff's Notes version of the steps that we have on the shades, that step two came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. It, it, it's written in past tense. It made it sound to me like in order to move to three, I have to already have come to believe. But as I was being walked through the chapter, we agnostics, I came to see that throughout there, there's a number of times where they say, as soon as somebody can say that they believe or are even willing to believe. And that was really how it is that I went through this process, right? I, 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 went, I went through the rest of the steps not fully believing, but I was willing to believe because I saw that there are other people who had felt what I was currently feeling or had experienced and were now free of some of the things that I had very recently experienced that I wasn't free of. So I went through the rest of the steps as kind of like an experiment. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow the directions here. I'm gonna conduct the experiment. I will see the results that I get on the other side and determine where that takes me, right? And so that's kind of how I went through this process. But the, but the thing that I knew really for sure and, and the way that this leads into three is I, had come to recognize that I had no reliable power over whether or not I were go was going to drink. Like I, I might be able to resist alcohol for a particular day or a particular week or whatever, but ultimately my human will was going to fail at that. So I was going to drink again. And then the other piece was the, was the life being unmanageable that when I thought back throughout my life, you know, there's a piece where it says, leaving the drink question aside, we show how we were making a heavy going of life. Um, I was a mess and in all kinds of pain before I really even started down the road of drinking. And I got to look too at the time that I had been in AA, like the time that since I had put the drink down, 
was all of a sudden everything amazing? No. You know, in fact, the guy that walked me through the book said, you know, you hear people say, oh, if you stop drinking and your life gets better, you're probably an alcoholic. And, and he said, no, if you're a real alcoholic and you stop drinking, your life is probably going to get worse because that was your attempt to solve a problem that didn't work. You stop attempting to solve it through that, the actual problem is still there. And the problem was, the real problem was my not having a workable means of functioning in the world, right? I was without a design for living. So I continued to experience pain and fear and things like that as the result of my attitudes and actions. And to try to numb that stuff out, I drank. Or to, to do what I felt like I needed to do to be okay, sometimes that caused me to have to make decisions that I didn't feel real good about. And so sometimes it was drinking to, to kind of quiet the voice that, that would have stopped me from doing. But as I kept going throughout life, like I, I kept gathering up more experiences like that. And so I had more and more things to drink over. So even physiological stuff aside, like it makes sense to me why my drinking would have been progressive because I wasn't living life successfully and life kept coming. I don't have a way out of that stuff. I do not belong in the driver's seat in my life. And in two, I came to at least be open to the perspective, like there are people who were in my circumstance that I can feel are no longer at it. And so whether it makes sense to me, whether I wanna believe it or not, like the only thing left for me to do is go down that road. Right, so here I am not step three. Another thing I hadn't known or hadn't really realized about step three, there's a piece in our book that talks about, um, you know, being at step three and it says, okay, the first requirement was, I didn't know anything about there being a first requirement for the third step. And I, and I tried it out after discovering that I would talk to some people in AA and I would ask them about the first requirement, the third step. And that, most people's eyes glazed over. They had no idea what I was talking about. And it says the first requirement is that I have to be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And you know, there's a page or two then of this, um, this picture of like a, a, an actor trying to run the whole show, wants to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, right? They did rather than just delivering their lines, playing their own role, they want to direct the show, produce the show, run the show and how that doesn't go well. And I had heard that before. I, I had heard it read at meetings. I heard people talk about it. I had always taken that as I have to recognize that my life run on self-will doesn't really work. Like here I am as an alcoholic and it, and it doesn't work so well. But as I was being walked through, through our text, um, I noticed that that's not what it says. It's not talking about me as an individual. It's not talking about alcoholics. It says the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. On that basis, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor trying to run the show. And there's a piece in the 12 and 12 where Bill in step three, his discussion of step three talks about um, you know, if, 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 if looking at ourselves in the mirror is too difficult, look around at the world. And he, he comes out and says, look around at the world trying to run on self-will. And it causes everybody to be in conflict with one another. It doesn't work. So the first requirement for me to take step three, to decide that I'm going to turn my will and my life over to God, first, I got to realize that there's no such thing, really as a life run on self-will working. If I still have somewhere in my head that it's possible to get away with it, I'm still gonna be looking for a way to get away with it, right? The, 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 real, um, the real power behind this is realizing that there's no such thing as it working. The problem isn't that I, I'm supposed to be managing my life and I'm doing a poor job at it. The problem is I'm not supposed to be trying to manage my life. I'm the actor. 
not the director, not the producer, right? I'm not meant to be the management. The, the, my current sponsor talks about um, picturing like a factory and, um, and there's the management office, you know, up, up, up on the second floor with a glass window looking down on the factory floor, you know, and the, the managers over the loudspeaker tell the people on the factory floor what to do. And so they receive their direction through the loudspeaker and they do the work. And, and I'm up there in the management office trying to manage and I do it poorly. I'm not meant to be in the management office. I'm meant to be down on the factory floor. And what AA, what this process prepares me to do is to be able to hear and respond to the directions coming over the loudspeaker for me to let God manage my life and listen for that direction on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, so I, I, I come to realize that, right? Okay, so this isn't gonna work, life lived on, on my own. And, um, and so there's a proposition then uh, to hereafter in this drama of life. We decided that hereafter in this drama of life, not I decided for the next 24 hours. And so I take the third step and then the next day I take the third step again. And then the next day I take the third step again. And it, it, it says, I decided that from this moment forward, hereafter in this drama of life, right? And so I look at step three now as it's like a vow. And I think of it like, I, you know, I'm married. I, I, I took a wedding vow. And in that vow, I said, I'm going to, through sickness and, and ill health, you know, through all these different things, like here's, here's how I'm going to be. Love, honor, cherish, obey, right? All these different things. I don't turn to my wife every day in the morning and say, you know what? I've decided that today I'm going to, it's going to be you and me. And, uh, and then the next day, wake up and say, you know what? I've decided today, it's just me and you. I'm just, I'm committed to you. If I were to get up and say that to her every morning, she'd be like, um, I'm wondering how much you really mean this thing. And that's how I look today. Like if I'm taking the third step every day, have I really decided that God's in charge of my life now? And so... I'm making a vow that hereafter in this drama of life, and just like with a wedding vow, my decision to do that doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily the same as my ability to do it. And so I may have that decision. I may find that um, I'm, I'm falling short in particular ways. It doesn't mean that I didn't mean it when I took the vow. And it doesn't undo the vow. I'm like, oh, I undid step three. I took it back, right? It means that I've made a decision. I've made a declaration of my intent, my goal, my purpose. But in order to make good on that, there's some stuff that's going to need to happen. See, if, my, if I actually turn my will and my life over to God in step three, then this would only be a three-step program. I, if God actually were in charge of my life and my will at that point, then nothing more would need to happen. That would be it. It would be a done deal. But I make that decision. And, and, and then our, our, our text even says, like, that's going to have little permanent effect unless followed at once by a vigorous course of action. And, um, and so that's steps four through nine, right? That is what needs to happen to clear out the channel in me, to prepare me, to make me able to make good on that third step decision. And when they talk about the vigorous course of action, it, it, it says that what needs to happen is I need to face and be rid of the things in me which had been blocking me from God. So the, the reason that I wanted to, to talk about three and four well, first off, I mean, in all transparency, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going through some difficult stuff and I, and I um, recognize that I was lacking in my application of this. I had started to place too much importance on those circumstances. And, um, and so I, I am going through another pass through the steps and I'm, in, I'm back in four right now. And so this stuff is all really fresh in my mind. And it's, it's, I felt like it was a perfect time to be able to 
clarify this for others and also to remind myself of particular things. And so the other reason though, is that I came to a shift in my understanding of the four step at some point that has been really profound. Like it's a, it's sort of a different way of envisioning it that unlocks something and has brought so much more, more power and freedom as a result. And that's that I, I had looked at four prior to that point as this inventory of kind of like an inventory of my relationships with other people, right? I'm looking at my relationships and I'm seeing the problems between me and others, like how were they caused and what did I do to, to perpetuate them? What are my attitudes towards them? And, and I'm, I'm looking at these defective relations and now this is enabling me to, to heal those relations. That's not the, uh, and there's a tremendous amount of freedom that's possible through doing that. But when I really look at this in the context of like following the thread that runs throughout, I got to see something different. It's saying that like what's prefacing step four is it's saying, okay, so I've come to see that my life run on my power is doomed, that there's this other thing available following God's direction. And so now I've made the decision that the rest of my life needs to be following that direction. But there's things in me that have me blocked from that power. And so I need to find out what they are and I need for them to be gone. And so I'm taking an inventory then to discover the things that have me blocked from God. The way that I'm finding that out, the vehicle, is by looking at my relationships with other people. But four isn't about my relationships with those people. It's about my relationship with God. It's what is the stuff in me that's got me blocked? And doing this as, you know, from that point of view brought me to a very different experience. So, um, you know, I, I just like a business, they, they, they use this example of like a business taking inventory and, um, and, and uh, looking at the stock in trade, you know, and, and taking a look at that. And um, so I thought about like, right, if I have a business and there's things on the shelves that are, uh, you know, outdated or, or, or rotten or simply things nobody wants any parts of, um, the business isn't going to do very well. I might be really attached though to the idea of some of those things and think that like, oh, those should be the best sellers. And people, maybe I, I really like those items and I want to hang on to them. And it says we need to not fool ourselves. A business owner needs to not fool themselves about the value. So I have to recognize that no matter how attached I might be to some of these things, if they're not working, they're not working. Right. So this isn't a, a question of how how valid or normal the things are. It's not a question of how much I like or dislike them, how identified with them I am or not. Um, throughout our text, they use this, they use all different uh, instances of the of forms of the word suffice. Suffice, sufficient, insufficient, sufficiently. They don't talk as much about good, bad, right, and wrong. And to suffice means like, is it equal to the task? Is it gonna get the job done? So this is a very practical approach. It's saying, what's going to work if I need a connection, if in order for me to survive alcoholism, what's going to work is my having a connection to this power. And if having a connection to this power, if what's not going to work is some of these things, then they, then they got to go. They're just not going to work. So looking at the, the things that I'm hanging on to, right? The resentments, the stuff that it might not be, I might not be going through every day burned up about these particular things. It could be somebody that I'm very good friends with. And on a day-to-day -day basis, we have a great time together. But every once in a while, somehow something that we're saying or something we do reminds me of an incident that happened in our friendship six years ago. And I'm, and I'm burned up in that moment. You know, it's still there. Like I get to have this feeling come up that makes me realize 
I'm not in that day and I'm still hanging on to it. I'm bringing the pains of the past along with me. So this idea that we see in AA of, of one day at a time, um, our book doesn't ever talk about not drinking one day at a time. The references to a day at a time all have to do with how we live or, or, or what we do spiritually. Faith has to work in us and through us 24 hours a day. Uh, each day is a day we have to carry the vision of God's will into all our activities, right? That's what we do one day at a time. And so I'm not living successfully if I'm in addition to trying to live today, I'm still holding on to all this stuff from the days past. Got to be free of those things. So I'm getting this stuff down on paper and listing the people, places, uh, uh, people, institutions, principles, um, the, the things that upset me. And I get those down and then I look at, okay, so what was, what's the cause, right? What did, what's my charge against them? Uh, here's how they've wronged me. Here's, here's what they did that I, that I don't approve of. Um, and then there's column three, which took a long, long time for me to really process the, the reason and purpose of column three. Cause I, I would fill out column three. There's this to list uh, two different times and it's a little bit redundant and it's, but it's like these aspects of self that are that are affected right and so i i today what i work with is there's seven things there's there's uh, self esteem you know how it is that i that i see myself uh, pride how i how i need you to see me how i feel like i appear to others uh, there's uh, personal relations, right? My, my interactions with other people, my friendships, coworkers, things like that. Sex relations, that one's kind of self-explanatory. Um, the, um, uh, my security and my, my pocketbooks or financial security, right? So, so there's my security in the sense of, of money and, and possessions. And then security, the, the emotional security, you know, I think of in the, in the sense of, um, of uh, safety and stability, right? If I, if I feel like I know what to expect, you know, that something's not gonna turn around and, and catch me wildly off guard, that there's some, some predictability and reliability um, to the way people work, the way society works, things like that. And then's my ambitions. The, 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 my plans, the things that I want. And I used to look at that as sort of the big picture plans. Like, what do I want to be when I grow up? You know, that, those kinds of things. But I came to realize that it, it, it applies even in little tiny situations, you know, like I, I got sober, I was in Manhattan and Brooklyn a lot. And um, so I was on the subway all the time. And you know, there might be somebody like I'm coming up the stairs and I'm in a hurry and there's somebody moving slowly in front of me. Or I get on the car and I want to sit down and relax and I see that there's somebody like sprawled out taking up three seats and that keeps me from being able to sit down. Um, well, I'm, I'm upset because that was, I had the ambition, my plan, my, my hope was to be able to sit down and relax or to hurry up and get up the subway stairs somewhere in time, right? So my, inner, my, my ambitions were fearful interfered with at that moment. I can, I, I see more truth if I kind of open it up a little bit more. So I get these things down that the, the, the stuff that I have in that second column either actually damaged some of those things, or I was bothered because some of those things were threatened. I was afraid that some of those things would be affected. And I would put these things down and then later on, like I, I, I kind of didn't know what to do with it. And even in like, even in the fifth step, like I would read the stuff off and I, I don't know, I'd listen to fifth steps. Like I would listen to somebody else talk and they'd say the third column and it felt like, okay, well, we're supposed to do that because it's there. I didn't really get it. And, um, and what I come to understand now is, and I look at it as kind of the, so what column, you know, it's like these things happen. Why was I bothered? And if the reason that I was bothered is because these different aspects of self were hurt or threatened, 
then I come to see that the real cause of the disturbance wasn't the thing. It was my attachment to these different areas of self. It was, I have, I've got a plan. I have a blueprint for how things are supposed to go, for how life is supposed to work, for how people, how people are to treat me, for who I'm supposed to be. And I walk through life with these demands and I come into people or I encounter situations, I come across principles that threaten my plan or that, or that undo my plan. And now I'm disturbed. Well, here I am, I'm, I'm going up against reality. I'm going up against God with my idea about this is how things are supposed to be. And it's like, God, reality is like, it is like looking and patting me on the head and going, well, that's adorable that, that you have that demand, but life is what life is. After those first three columns, uh, I would, there was a point then at which after I would do those first three columns, I would, I would move right into four, right? Like I would do the first column, second column, third column, and then I'd go into, okay, now, uh, you know, the, the next directions talk about um, setting aside the wrongs others had done and looking for my own mistakes. And again, it was time um, before I recognized something in there that, that there, something's meant to happen in between columns three and columns four, that there's that little diagram in our book that shows like, you know, we were usually as definite as this example. And it gives us like a picture of those first three columns. And then, then it says, when finished, we considered it carefully, right? So it's, it's telling you stop and think about some stuff. And then there's a full page of things at the end of which it says, now we turn back to the list for we're prepared to look at it from an entirely different angle. So I had been jumping right from three into four, but there's what I now consider like a, a, a page of meditations uh, for me to consider. And, and what it talks about is, you know, here I am burned up about these things. Well, what's the usual result of that? Isn't it that I, I stay sore, the people keep doing what they're doing. Sometimes I get them back um, and, and feel like I won, but a lot of times then I feel guilty about it. Um, that, that carrying this stuff around, being in this place can lead only to futility and unhappiness. Um, and that, and that for, for quote unquote, normal people, right. For non-alcoholic people, um, these things are dubious luxuries meaning like it can feel like they get to be angry but is is that really a good thing like is that a luxury but for me that's poison because i've already come to acknowledge that the only shot for me to survive alcoholism is a connection to this power and if and if my reaction to these things blocks me it's deadly to me right so what's really interesting to me about that is all of those things that they asked me to consider, it's all appeals to ego. None of it is look at those first three columns and realize that that's not a good way to be. And that's your parents taught you better than that, or that the, the guy behind the pulpit, you know, the, is, is, is telling you that you're supposed to be better than that. Um, I'm still at this point, I'm still blocked. At this point in the process, I'm still driven by selfishness and self-centeredness, by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. So to say I'm supposed to be saintly isn't going to appeal. This page of stuff is to help my ego to wake up to the fact that it's not going to get what it wants if it continues on the way that it is. I'm going to be in pain. I'm going to suffer. This is not going to work. It's bringing me back to that first step experience. And, um, but what's more is now that I've taken that third step decision, I've, I've made the decision that my life doesn't belong to me anymore. 
that I'm now going to live in the service of something more. And so to say that this resentment is only going to lead to futility and unhappiness, that it squanders the hours that might have other been, uh, otherwise been worthwhile, I have to realize I'm no longer squandering my time. I'm squandering God's potential use for me, right? I'm spending time in this when I could be out saying, God, what would you have me do? How do I serve you and my fellows? So it's through all that that I come to the place where I'm prepared to look at this from a different angle and realize now back to that first requirement of step three, any life run on self can hardly be a success. And that people in general are going through the world possibly with good intent. There's that piece in the, in the, in the picture of the actor when it says, uh, you know, that they might be sure that everybody would be pleased um, if, if, if they would follow the plan, right? Um, that, that we might be modest and, and patient and generous and self-sacrificing. But somewhere in there, there's a personal plan. Well, that actually helps me now. If I've come to realize that already, that's a help to me here. Because now when I'm looking and saying, perhaps these people are spiritually sick, and not in a condescending way, it's they, like me, are spiritually sick. I get to realize that they, like me, are people going through the world, feeling like it's our job to make things a particular way possibly for the benefit of all, but mostly driven by fear, afraid that we're not gonna be taken care of. And so we're running out into the world trying to shape things for us to be able to be okay. And I look back and I realize how many people I hurt. I didn't really want to hurt anybody, but I did it anyway. And I felt a lot of guilt and shame around them in different circumstances, right? So I, get, I have the opportunity to realize here, what if I were to grant that same possibility to others? What if even the people that I think of as horrific, what if they're not interested in being harmful to others, but they're driven by fear? What if they feel like in order to be okay, they need to try to make everybody else do what they want, that they needed to do whatever they did to me in order for them to feel okay? Why is that? Why, why do I expect to be forgiven and get a second chance for that? I'm not willing to grant one to them. We're all children of God. We're all in this together. There's that prayer sometimes called the sick man's prayer about... Um, you know, uh, to, to, to God help me to see that this person's maybe spiritually sick like me. And then says, God, save me from being angry. And I find that really interesting. Like it, it doesn't say, God, forgive me for having made the decision to be angry. Save me from being angry. I don't have a choice in whether or not I get angry about this stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll unpack that in a second. Um, I don't have a choice in whether or not I get angry about it. It's not a decision I'm making. I need to be saved from it. And, and, and that's my previous approaches to the fourth step. And, and, and some of what I hear commonly as approach to the fourth step is we come up with in the fourth column, we come up with, okay, so now I'm going to look at my, so I'm going to look at my part and, and what did I do to put myself in that position? Yeah, well, I never should have dated her to begin with. I, I, I had indications that she was going to be crazy, you know, or, or, oh, what was I doing running with that crowd to begin with? Or, I, whatever it is. I mean, there's things that I could say that I put myself in a position to be heard, or here's what I did after the fact to get them back. Um, there's more, there's more available than that. And I'm losing track for a moment. Let me just take a breath. Oh, right, save me from being angry. Um, when, when I, in other four steps, would get angry, I would, I would feel anger and then I would say, okay, God, take, take the anger away and I might talk to somebody else about it. 
and then you know, hopefully the anger at some point will dissipate. But I don't know, the next day, the next week, the next month, the thing would happen again, I'd get angry again. And then I'd have to go back into prayer and back to talking to people about it, back to taking a meeting hostage with how it is that I'm feeling, you know. Um, I, I don't have a choice in that, right? So if I'm going to be free, this talks about our finding freedom. I've got to be free of this stuff. In order to get free, I need to look at what's the cause of the anger. So in that fourth column now, I'm, first off, I'm not looking for my part. It was years in before there was a speaker that I heard talking about that. She said, take a look at that paragraph there uh, of the fourth column. Nowhere does it say to look at our part. Now it says, though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely, right? So sure, they might've done something, but this has nothing to do with them. Because if I, if I understand that my purpose in this inventory is to see what's got me blocked from God. They can't have any role in what blocks me from God. They talk about God as the deep down, the, the, the great reality deep down within each of us, or, or there's a reference to, uh, to God as that untapped inner resource, right? If my connection to God is within, nothing outside of me can impact that connection. If I'm blocked, it is not their fault at all. I have 100% of the responsibility. I'm not looking for my part. I'm looking for where I am wrong in my, in my actions and attitudes. And the actions are a vehicle to, to, to discover things, but really, I got to look at the attitudes. It is the defective attitudes that have me blocked and that cause the pain. So that's what I'm after. What I find now, there's all the there's all the sort of standard stuff that we would look at, right? If you've ever done a four step, if you've heard about a four step, if the, you know, there, there's sort of like the standard approach to the fourth column stuff. But what I was shown, um, let me to go a step behind. I'm dog sitting for a moment. Um, is that I have the opportunity to look at what, what is it, what's the belief, what's the demand in me that's leading me to be angry? And now's where I can go back and look at that third column stuff. If my self-esteem was, was impacted, right? I, well, gosh, that means, first of all, there's a lack of integrity in there because if you can do something to challenge my sense of who I am, then that means I don't have a very stable sense of who I am. It means that I'm not, I, I'm, I'm lacking a real rudder. I'm not rooted in values. If anything that people do can call, can call that into question. But it also means that I have a demand to, to see myself in a particular way. Well, if I have that demand, it can be threatened, right? The pride, if I, if, I'm, if I need to be seen a particular way, then if you say, so if I share at a meeting and you share after me and, and clearly contradict what I just said, and I feel upset by that, the reason I'm upset, one of them, is that I don't like that other people in the room just saw you contradict me. I don't like that there might be people in the room that now think I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, if that's why I'm upset, as long as I'm attached to the idea that people need to think of me in a certain way, I'm walking around waiting to be angered by information that shows that they don't see me that way. So if I'm really going to be free, I need to get that down. I need to get down that the defect is the demand for others to see me as. And I can, through the process of doing this, I can start to build up this picture of like this demand that I have the world, that the world see me in a particular way and treat me in a particular way. These ambitions that I have, I have this idea that in order for me to be happy and at peace, there's stuff that needs to happen. 
And if those things don't happen, it sends me into fear and I'm disturbed, right? So the only path for me to ever truly be free is to identify this stuff. These are the defects. These are the demands that I'm placing on God and reality. And then when I get into step six, those are the things that if I'm willing to have them taken, the thing can happen and I won't be upset, right? That, that if I share and somebody contradicted what I said. So yeah, there might be pride in that. There might be ambitions too, though. Like I want to save everybody. I don't, I don't like the experience of, of watching people suffer. It pains me. And so I, need, I, I, I have the ambition that they're all going to get better so that we can all have a happy experience together. And if they're challenging the idea that I know what I'm talking about, well, well gosh, then it threatens that as well. And uh, I want to think of myself as knowing this program really well and being a great example of it. And this is calling that into question. Right? So maybe I identify those things and I say, okay, well, if the pride were taken, would I still be able to be upset? And then I realize, oh yeah, there is that, there's that self-esteem in there too. So even if, even if a wand was waved and my pride was gone, I'd still be able to be disturbed because of the self-esteem stuff. Okay, well, let's say we wave a wand and that's gone. If God took that, could I still be upset? And then I see, oh, here's the defects related to the ambitions, right? And so with each step then I can, what I do in the fourth column now is as I'm making that list of things, I say, if this were taken, if this were taken, if this were taken, would I still be upset with that? And sometimes it, it takes a minute. I realize I would be, but I can't see it yet. Take that into some more prayer and meditation. But if I get to the place where I can say, yes, if God took these things, that could happen to me tomorrow. And I wouldn't need to be upset by it. That is why when they say we turn back to the list, it holds the key to the future. Because what we're going to come out of step four with is a list of this on this piece of paper shows everything that causes my pain. What other people do does not cause my fear and pain. My fear and pain is caused by the demands on this piece of paper. Am I willing to have those removed so that I can go through life not at the whim of how people decide that they're going to act, not subject to those billions of people that are driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. I wish I would have left myself more time. I would love to have gotten into the fear and sex inventory part of this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respect my time limit, and I'm going to wrap with that. Thank you so much for this opportunity.